Good morning, everybody. My name is Monica Odstian, and I'm the head of nuclear R&D at Energiforsk, which is the R&D coordinator for the energy industry. Today, you will hear more about the impact of climate change on nuclear. And this is part of a large project that we have uh, carried out at Energiforsk, analyzing the impact of climate change on the entire energy system. And this project has been financed by the energy industry, including the, the owner companies of the nuclear power plants in the Nordic countries, but also the Swedish Energy Agency, the Swedish GSO, Svenska Kraftnät, insurance company IF, and the foundations Årforsk and IVL. It's been carried out by researchers from the Swedish Meteorological and Hydrological Institute, Profu, IVL, and Energiforsk. And the entire report from um, the project is uh, already published on the Energy First Web. This is unfortunately in Sweden, but uh, we have also a um, report in English that's focused on nuclear, and that will be published within like a week or something. And this has been uh, quite a large project. It's uh, close to 100 persons from stakeholders, authorities, and regions that have participated in the steering and working groups. And in this uh, short webinar today, you will hear more about some condensed results from the entire project, and then we will zoom in on the results from there. And I would like uh, to ask everybody to please keep your microphones uh, muted. And I would also like to say that for me, this has been an extremely interesting project to participate in. It's been almost like a personal journey. I mean, you hear all about this uh, climate change, you'll read the black headlines. But when you're in a project like this and you really get the details and the analysis that are behind it, you really fully understand what it is that's happening. And as I said, we will start with the condensed results from the entire project. The, it will be first a presentation by Erik Kjellström from SMHOI on changing climate. And then Jenny Gode will summarize the overall results for the entire energy system. And then Thomas Unger will elaborate on the impact of climate change on nuclear. And then we have the questions and discussions. And I would really like to encourage you to, to ask questions, but please try to save them for this uh, discussion at the end, since we have a quite tight schedule. And then we have some, uh, some sort of house rules, and uh, the slides and video will be published on the Energy Force web. And um, you will receive an email with a link as soon as it's up and running on our web. Please keep microphones muted and cameras switched off so that everybody will get a, a good connection, a good performance during the, the webinar. And as I said, please ask questions during discussions, either raise your hand or write in the chat. And when I call your name, please unmute your microphone, turn on the camera and introduce yourself. Just briefly name an organization before you ask your questions. Okay, so let's get started then. And I would like to invite uh, Erik Kjellström from SMOE. Please, Erik. Good morning and thank you very much. Uh, I will just try to share my screen here. Hang on a second. There we go. So. There, can you com confirm that you see my first slide now? Yes, good? thank you very much, Eric. Excellent, very good. Thank you very much, Monica, and uh, good morning to everyone. I will talk very briefly about the climate uh, part in this project. I'm uh, Eric Kjellström. I work as a professor in climatology at the Swedish Meteorological and Hydrological Institute. So uh, in Sweden and also everywhere, basically, there is a very strong uh, ongoing climate change signal, as you know, and these are just some maps showing this for Swedish conditions where I where we have uh, compared the two last 30 year periods to each other. We just shifted climate normals here a, a, a couple of months ago. So we can see that over the last 30 years, it has been more than one degree warmer in annual averages compared to the 30 years preceding that. And uh, we also see that precipitation has increased. 
with uh, about 8% or so in Sweden over this time. And these changes are can be seen in very many places. And uh, we see, apart from these annual mean features, we see really that this, the seasons are shifting and that we have longer summers, we have shorter winters, and there is less snow and less ice. And we also see changes in different types of extremes as well. Right. So there is definitely an ongoing climate change, as we all know. And uh, what will happen in the future? Well, we don't really know. We yeah. know some things, but we don't know what will happen in the long run. But uh, if we just look at the short run, we at the time for the for the time being, the global warming is such that it, it warms about 0.2 degrees as a global average uh, temperature over each decade. So that means that in approximately 20 years or so, uh, we will reach 1.5 degree warming above the pre-industrial conditions. And this is the goal really of the Paris Agreement to try to strive towards keeping it at that level. So it's a very short time hor horizon we're talking about there. Uh, given that the warming continues, it's about another roughly 20 or 25 years before we reach the two degree level. And it's quite likely that we will reach these levels. And uh, with today's emissions and, and knowledge about future emissions and reductions and etc., uh, it's more likely that we will end up somewhere close to three degrees or so. And this is what this uh, uh, thermometer shows here on to the right. So there will definitely be uh, warming over the next decades or so, uh, more or less regardless of what we do at, at the moment with the emissions. But the, the level in the long run is, of course, very much determined by that. Having said that, we can also look at then some results, and, and this is all about the gradual change. So here are some maps for the whole European region, indicating then what the warming could look like at these different levels. And you can see the different global warming levels on top there, from starting from 1.5 to the left, all the way up to 4 degrees to the right. And if you then look at uh, these are now changes versus uh, the... Uh, I didn't write it in here, but this is about the historical period. So it's a couple of days, just a few decades ago. So these are warming levels and, and what will happen until then. And then we can see that the warming in Europe is very large and it's actually warmest, largest up here in the north and also in the Mediterranean area. Uh, we can see this con gradually continuing change of, of the seasons. And this is the second row. It indicates days during winter when the temperature is close to zero degrees. So when it's both above and below zero degrees in the same day. And this, these are days when you can have melting and freezing uh, occurring more, more or less in the same day. And these are days when there can be quite, uh, yeah, there can be quite difficult conditions in these days with a lot of wet snow, for instance, and freezing conditions and, and stuff like that. And that uh, signal, as you see here in the maps, it's actually increasing in the north. So in the winter months, we see more of those conditions in the north where we today have a very cold climate, but then it will be more of these days close to zero. The two lowermost rows here indicate that precipitation will, in Northern Europe, likely increase, especially in winter, but also in, in summer. Uh, while in Southern Europe, there is a clear decrease in precipitation in, in, in the summer half of the, of the year. So this is a manifestation of the fact that the hydrological cycle globally is intensifying with, more, with higher temperatures. As more water vapor can be held in the atmosphere, it's also more intense. So there is more evaporation from the oceans and other areas and also more precipitation, so more intense hydrological cycle. So it means in general more, more pre precipitation, but it also means that uh, when we have dry periods, there can be a very strong drying and, and a lot of evaporation. So we will have both extreme and more extreme precipitation, but also extreme drought and uh, dry conditions. Uh, talking about extremes, this is just a very general one. It's uh, showing a little bit what might happen to temperature in the diagram here. So, uh, But before going into that, I will just like to say an emphasis here. It's really important, especially when you talk about very rare events, which are very important also for the nuclear industry especially. So these events are very unusual and therefore they are usually not observed by, simply by the fact that they are so rare and, and unusual. So that, that means that all assessments of such uh, rare events and also changes in these, they are uncertain. There are, there are big uncertainties associated with it, especially in terms of uh, previous, I mean, observations from the last decades. So we don't have that much observations, actually. And another fact here is that if we want to look at compound events, that is, there are two things happening at the same time. So if there is, for instance, a very strong windstorm at the same time as there are 
there is a lot of water in, in some river ending up at the sea. So these are two extremes ha happening at the same time, which can have very difficult conditions, of course, in, in the outlet of that river, for instance. Uh, that's so even more unusual that, that it happens at the same time. So these are even more uncertain, I would say. But having said that, we still know something about extremes. And we know that in a warmer climate, we will have more warm extremes and less cold extremes. And this is what's illustrated by the graph here with the red curve is the future warmer climates. So there is a larger probability for the warm extremes, but also a, a smaller probability for the, for the cold extremes. And we will also have, as I said before, as the uh, hydrological cycle is intensifying, there will be more wet and more, uh, but also more dry extremes at the same, no, not, not at the same time, but occurring. It'll be the same, that is the same kind of change signal we see, both more ex wet extremes and also more dry conditions. Uh, changes in wind extremes in the material we have, lo have looked at here, we have uh, more than 60 regional climate models operating over, over uh, Europe. We don't see any strong signals of changing wind extremes in the future. Uh, but still, there is, it's likely with higher sea level extremes, and I will get back to that in a, in a second. Oh, that was just some extra. So, and if we just look at then, uh, some temperature index indices here and, and the indications of warmer summer conditions and really hot summer, summer conditions. So these are now results from these 60 or so regional climate models. And the, the maps we are looking at here are, are in, in increases in maximum temperature to the left. We have the number of consecutive days. So these are heat waves and long periods with hot conditions in the middle. And to the right, it's the number of so-called tropical nights. That's nights when the temperatures don't fall below 20 degrees. So all of these maps show red colors here indicating increases. So they, in the future, there will be more, uh, more of various kinds and types of, of warm extremes. And these maps all concern the atmosphere and atmospheric temperatures. But the same, of course, goes for the sea surface temperatures in the, in the Baltic Sea, for instance. Uh, will there be more lightning is another other question that we often get, and it's of course relevant for, for uh, all power grids, etc. So uh, we have competing effects here. We have warmer and more humid conditions, in, which is really in favor of, of more lightning. So that's what we see for the future. But at the same time, if the clouds, when the atmosphere gets warmer, if the clouds are warmer, there is could be a, a slightly smaller risk actually for ice in these clouds, and, and that would lead to uh, diminished risk for lightning. But uh, all in all, and this is what these two graphs here show from a, a student paper we had in Stockholm a year ago, or so they, they indicate still a longer season with more risk of lightning. So there is a there is a risk for increased lightning in the future. Sorry, I was muted very shortly. I will, I'm finished in a minute or so. Uh, there is also a risk for the longer, longer season for more lightning and, and heavy, these heavy conditions with uh, also strong showers, etc., and the hail and, and other, other features connected to them. So there is definitely a risk for more intense events here. Uh, the next thing I want to say something about is... Um, sorry. Sea level changes, and uh, we have two things here main, mainly. These, first of all, there are the global sea level rise, uh, but that's partly counteracted by land uplift in, in the Scandinavian area, as seen in the graph to the right here. So these are uh, the, the numbers here are uh, millimeters of of, uh, of uh, land uplift every year, and the global mean sea level rise is about three mil three point five millimeters per year at the moment. So this is the line, the zero line, so to speak. So south of this line there is actually sea level rise at the moment. The north of it, it's sea level is sinking. So these are also the power plants in, the, in, the, in Finland and Sweden that are outlined here. So some of them are south of the line and some of them are north of the line. And then the, we have some numbers here for the Swedish conditions and the, the numbers here are from, um, uh, the, these numbers in, in parentheses are from the IPCC reports here as these percentiles here. So it's, it's not a, an, an absolute up, upper level, but uh, it's a, these are quite high levels anyway. So, so for three of the different places in Sweden, and you can see here Forsmark, which is north of the line, has much lower numbers, of course, than the others. But then we also have the extreme levels, and, uh, and these are now, these 
table to the bottom here, it's uh, these are based on uh, observations by, by actually. So these are observed high conditions and they're they based on 40 to 50 year time series. And as I said before, the numbers are uncertain for that level. And then you can add these numbers together. These are in meters in the, in the lowermost table and in centimeters in the uppermost one. So this is where we are in, in, in a number of different scenarios. But we have not calculated extreme levels based on future wind storms and future extreme conditions since that information is not so certain. So that's basically what I wanted to say. So this is a short summary. We have already seen these very strong changes and we expect a continued gradual uh, change. And uh, we see warming, warming, of course, with changing seasons. We see a more intensified hydrological cycle with more precipitation, but also increased risk of droughts. And we see more and changed extremes. And the only extremes that are really not increasing is uh, cold extremes, of course, that, is, that are decreasing. And there is a uncertainty related to future wind speeds. We also I should finally find, end with saying just that there is still a lack of solid information about future heavy rainfall, lightning, and, and these compound events. And this is partly related to model resolution in the climate models that we're using that is not uh, high enough, I would say. So thank you very much. Thank you, Eric, for pro providing us with this background. And let's move over then to Jenny Goder from Profo. And that will tell us about how will climate change impact the entire energy system, the main conclusions. Please, Jenny. Thank you very much, Monica. Good morning, everybody. I am Jenny Gode, I work at Profu. I've also had the honor of being main project leader of this project. I mean, this webinar is focused on nuclear power, but before my colleague Thomas goes deeper into nuclear power, I will give you some a brief summary of some of the main conclusions regarding the impact of climate change for the energy system as a whole. And the conclusions I will present are based on results from the entire project where all these very skilled researchers have been involved. So thank you very much, everybody. And I would also like to thank the funders of this project that Monica mentioned and um, the participants in the steering group and working groups. My main message today is that although climate change will have an impact on the energy system, the impact is considered manageable up to 2040. But having said that, there will be an impact and it's still important to follow the development and prepare for climate change in coming investments. And of course, if we fail globally to achieve the targets in the Paris Agreement, and we end up in higher temperature increases, of course, the impacts will be more significant. Today, I will highlight three of the main conclusions from the project, but you can also read more about the results in the various reports of the project. The first conclusion is about the time aspect. Climate change affects the energy system both through sudden events and successive gradual changes. Sudden events occur on rare occasions and uh, mainly affect the facilities at the specific geographical sites. Sudden events have uh, predominantly negative effects on the energy system. On the other hand, changes that take place gradually and are, I mean, they are more widespread both in time and also in space and they can have uh, both positive and negative effects on the energy system. And I will now give some examples on how climate change on different time scales can affect the energy system. Thunderstorms. There are sudden events that can negatively affect the electricity grid and by affecting the electricity grid, the effects can also spread to other facilities. As uh, Eric just mentioned, SMHI estimates that thunderstorms will be more, become more common. So these problems may, of course, increase. Excuse me, Yanni, I can't see your slides or your sharing, or is it just me? Oops, I tried to share, but let's... I thought you were bold and not using slides. <laughs> mm -hmm. No, no, I tried to. I. Okay, let's try again. I hope it's okay to start from here. 
Okay, yes, now I can see your slides. Thank you so much, Thomas. Perfect that you told me. All right. Let's continue. I just spoke about thunderstorms. And we continue to the hourly level. Of course, extreme precipitation is one example. It can affect several parts of the energy system, but perhaps especially hydropower, which, I mean, it can be forced to spill water, for example. Extreme precipitation is also expected to become more common, as Eric just mentioned. And of course, this needs to be taken into account into, in the future. Several days in a row with no or very low wind will affect the wind power sector, of course. And with a strong expansion of wind power that we expect for the future, these lull periods will, of course, affect the entire electricity system as well. As Eric just mentioned, it is less likely that these events will become more common, but with a lot of wind power in the system, the effects of very low wind when it occurs can, of course, be large. At the seasonal level, drought can affect several parts of the energy system. It's mainly in the southern Sweden that dry periods can become more common. So, for example, hydropower in the south can be affected, and they already see this effect. But in the event of a drought, the risk of forest fires also increases, which can affect the supply of biofuels. For example, lead to increased supply when fire damaged trees can't be used for other purposes, such as timber. A very typical gradual change is increased temperature, which of course affects the energy demand. So the demand for district heating will decrease, and when the demand for district heating decreases, the potential for a combined heat and power will also decrease. And finally, Another gradual change is about the sea level, as Eric just mentioned too. And uh, I mean, of course, this may affect coastal infrastructure. But since this change is slow and gradual, there is time for adaptation. So climate change will affect the energy system. But in this project, we also see that other external factors, factors often are at least as uh, crucial. So that is the main conclusion number two that I will uh, speak about today. And I will now give some examples. We start with hydropower. We believe that climate change will have a significant impact, but of equal or even greater importance is the development of the electricity system with more wind power, increased electricity demand, and increased also environmental requirements. Wind power is probably not affected so much by climate change, but as I mentioned, this we foresee this powerful expansion, and this means that a small change can have a major impact. But since the the most most of the expansion is probably ahead of us there is an opportunity to adapt to climate change. Thomas will soon speak more about nuclear power, but as we can see, it seems to be very robust against climate change. So other factor, external factors are much more important here. The bioenergy sector, it's a bit tricky since it's indirectly affected by climate change. First, there is an impact on the forest, and then the forest industry, and then potentially the bioenergy sector. And here we see both threats and opportunities. And at the same time, other factors such as future competition for the raw material, biomass material and sustainability aspect, aspects also play crucial roles. The district heating sector is of course largely affected by climate change. The signal is clear, a warmer climate, and it will reduce the demand for climate for district heating and for also for electricity production in CHP plants. And this at a time when we really need this local electricity production. At the same time, the demand for, dis, uh, for district cooling may, of course, increase. 
And uh, there are, of course, also other external factors here that affect, for example, the future population, energy efficient improvement, uh, improvement and uh, competition with other heating and cooling. Finally, the impact of climate change on the electricity grid can also be large, and there are a few positive as, uh, effects here, except may possi possibly reduced ice formation in southern Sweden. And this expected increase in electricity demand will require new investments. And of course, it's very important to take climate change into consideration when in these investments. And that leads me to the final conclusion today. It's about preparation and adaptation. And we see that there are various measures to reduce risks and also take advantage of potential opportunities. So, I will here highlight two examples. The first is about the electricity grid. It is sensitive to weather, ex extreme weather we events already today, and it's very crucial for the functioning of the entire energy system. So we see that uh, improved forecast for thunderstorms is needed, and it's also important to continue to improve the climate robustness of the grid, both in investments in the existing grid, and of course, in the new investments that we foresee. And the second example here applies to hydropower, which also has a crucial role for, role for the entire energy system. And examples of measures here include continued development of forecasting tools for runoff, and also for better production of water planning to take into account both the increased share of wind power that we foresee and in the elect uh, electricity system and, and also take into account climate change. And if we do this and we prepare and adapt to climate change, we believe that the impacts are manageable up to 2040. And what will happen after that, of course, depends to a large extent on the development of the global emissions and the future energy system. So uh, thank you very much for your attention. And if you have any questions about the project as a whole, you're very welcome to contact me. And I also recommend you to visit Energiforce website to download the reports. Thank you very much, Jenny. And uh, let's proceed then with uh, Thomas that will uh, take us into more details about uh, the analysis that we made uh, focused on nuclear. Let's welcome Thomas. Thank you very much, Monica. I hope you can hear me and I hope you can see my slide. Yes, perfect. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Thomas Unger. I am uh, normally with Profu. I'm a colleague to Janni and uh, my task in this study has been to manage the uh, working group on nuclear power. As Monica said, and Janni also, we've had several working groups, one for each energy source, and I've been involved in the working group on nuclear, where I have had the opportunity to merge the knowledge and expertise supplied to the project by Erik and his colleagues at SMHI with the expertise of the nuclear industry. So in the working group, we've had participants from from uh, all nuclear sites uh, in the Nordic countries, Sweden and Finland. And for their participation and their contribution, I am personally very grateful. So uh, let's start by just uh, making some clarifications on the scope uh, of this study and some important demarcations that we have uh, used. Uh, it is about nuclear power in the Nordic countries, in Sweden and Finland, uh, but we have a certain focus uh, on Sweden because the available data material from the climate modeling uh, was more uh, centred centered around the conditions in Sweden. The system of focus is the power plant and the power plant site in itself, so we are not considering any upstream effects or impacts on the uh, fuel uh, supply or fuel chain of fuel distribution and of course not uh, we, we also um, exclude any downstream uh, considerations in this matter. 
the assessment, uh, the impact assessment on the on, on nuclear power has uh, been based on the available data uh, that Eric uh, presented from specific climate model runs, but also on complementary assessments on other knowledge and findings uh, complementing uh, these model runs. So there is a mixture of uh, both qualitative and quantitative estimates in this study. Uh, and, and once again, I also want to emphasize, it's a bit boring, but it's very important that there are large remaining uncertainties for certain relevant weather events and phenomena, especially uh, of relevance also to, to the nuclear industry. While other observations uh, based on, on, on these modeling uh, are um, uh, associated with a, a, a relatively large degree of certainty. So there's a big difference there be, uh, be between the different weather phenomena, different weather events, of course. And the final impacts uh, and the impact assessment, what all this means uh, for the operation of uh, a nuclear power plant that has been a result of the discussions uh, that we have made in, uh, in the working group. So uh, I'll start by firing away the most important findings, uh, the key messages. Uh, repeat what Jenny just said, uh, based on the data that was made available to this project, the global temperature pathways that we have been analyzing, and given the, the long but in a way still foreseeable future that we are discussing here, we find in general that uh, nuclear power is a very climate robust source of energy. Uh, and this is a result of, of course, the extremely high safety standards uh, that are normal procedures at the nuclear power plant, and also the high margins against operational disturbances. Uh, because design and planning at a nuclear power plant uh, with respect to extreme events is uh, out of natural reasons, of course, normal business. Um, uh, and uh, th these high levels are also a result of uh, continuous improvements that have been made over the years, uh, both in terms of safety and in terms of operation. But we may also say this because even though we find or can already today see effects of climate change, some of these uh, changes are progressing relatively slow. And some of them uh, who have uh, high relevance uh, to nuclear power, they progress in a pace that enables sufficient time for adaptation. I will get back to that. So, Climate change impact on nuclear power in the Nordic countries is primarily a matter of increased risk of operational disturbances, uh, resulting in unplanned outages, for instance, and not the concern for safety. There might be uh, 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 some indicative exceptions in the long run. I will get back to that also when it comes to safety. Uh, but when it comes to safety, uh, the existing measures and, and the Scandinavian countries, Finland, Sweden, the additional measures that have been made in the wake of the Fukushima accident. Uh, for instance, in Sweden, we refer to the independent core cooling system that is designed to handle very extreme events uh, with a frequency of, of uh, less than once in a million years. Uh, we believe that this is, of course, uh, highly beneficial uh, also in terms of resilience uh, to the negative impacts of climate change. And this, of course, distinguishes nuclear power from the other energy sources that we have been uh, analyzing this study, maybe with a certain exception. Well, not a certain maybe, I would say, with an exception for, for um, dam safety and hydropower that also is associated with the very high standards of safety. So it is above all uh, a question of economics to the nuclear power plant owner, and it's a question of security of supply for the electricity market. We have also found uh, and learned in our discussions uh, that there are uh, an array of measures at hand uh, already today 
but also additionally available if that is considered necessary and if that is considered profitable because it's ultimately a question of finding the balance between additional costs and benefits. Once again, this is primarily about the operation of nuclear power plants. But as Eric has told us, and which is important to, to remind ourselves of, is that there are large remaining uncertainties. For instance, uh, regarding the frequency and amplitude of certain relevant weather events. Um, extreme events such as very, very extreme thunderstorms and compound events, that is combinations of several extreme events that Eric was mentioning earlier. So this is why the nuclear industry needs to continue to monitor uh, climate change research. I emphasize continue because that's what they are doing, are obliged to do in their mandatory uh, periodic safety reviews, which occurs uh, typically every 10 years. And this is done by the licensees, uh, and these reviews report on the prospects and conditions uh, for operating a nuclear power plant uh, safely also for the coming decade. And in these assessments, uh, also new research, including research within the field of climate change, has to be considered. And it's our hope and belief that the findings that we have done in this study may help in that continuous work uh, in the nuclear industry and the Nordic countries. And then there also is the uh, issue of event classification, which is normally uh, used in nuclear safety. Uh, it, it defines the probability and the degree of severity of a specific extreme event. And the findings uh, of um, climate research might actually also uh, lead to a reclassification uh, of specific weather events. Uh, that is, that a certain weather event may in fact uh, reappear with an increased frequency due to climate change. This is something that we qualitatively have um, seen, but we have not been able to quantify that effect uh, because these event classifications are uh, important instruments in the safety work at the, the nuclear power plants. Now, uh, from what I've uh, learned, you're quite an international gathering today listening to us. Uh, so. Maybe there are a couple of you who are not so familiar with the uh, nuclear sector and the uh, Nordic countries. Uh, the Nordic countries are four, but there are only two where we have nuclear power, Sweden and Finland. And in this map, you can see the localizations. Uh, there are uh, five sites in the Nordic countries. Uh, we have um, the West Coast in Sweden, we have Ringhals which up to uh, two years ago, I would say, was considered as the largest power plant in the Nordic countries. But since then we have um, closed two units. Uh, we have the Forsmark facility here and Oskarshamn uh, with one unit left uh, to have also been closed at the Baltic Sea, the East Coast. And in Finland, uh, here um, far east, we have the Luisa power plant with two units. And uh, at the Finnish west coast, also the Baltic Sea, we have the Olgiuloto plant uh, consisting currently uh, of two units, but where the third unit is uh, due to, um, uh, to, to a grid connection uh, within short. And then there are uh, Initial uh, working uh, have already started uh, for the Hanhikivi power plant, uh, one unit up in the north, even though, uh, to my knowledge, uh, all the licenses have not yet been approved. So uh, maybe in a decade, uh, we would uh, possibly see uh, six different sites uh, of nuclear power in, in, in Sweden and Finland. So with Olkiloto 3 online, we would have around 11 gigawatts installed. Uh, that is around 10% of the total installed capacity of electricity generation in the Nordic countries and the four Nordic countries, I should add. It's an integrated uh, market. Uh, the uh, contribution in terms of energy, terawatt hours is of course bigger because nuclear power has um, 
the, the utilization time, the annual uh, operational time is of course uh, high uh, normally in nuclear power plants compared to, for instance, uh, wind power and, and uh, also combined heat and power plants. So you can see that the localizations uh, are all along the coasts. Uh, this is of course beneficial in terms of cooling. Um, see what the temperatures um, uh, at, at sea are normally more beneficial than, for instance, uh, in continental Europe, where most of the power plants, the nuclear power plants, actually are localized inland, uh, adjacent to large rivers, for instance, uh, that tend to become warmer during summertime, for instance. There are also large local differences between these six sites uh, in terms of topography, in terms of seawater temperature, in terms of ice formation, uh, intake depths of the cooling water, for instance. So although there are many things that are general uh, to the power plant sites uh, in Finland and Sweden, there are also, of course, local differences. We have seen occasionally uh, that uh, weather and weather-related events have led to unplanned outages uh, in Sweden and in Finland. I have um, listed here a couple of uh, fairly well-known uh, events uh, that have disturbed the operation. For instance, the uh, heat wave of summer 2018, which impacted the production both at Ringhals and Lovisa. Uh, we have the intrusion of jellyfish uh, that uh, uh, disturbed the production at the Oskarshamn site, uh, both in 2013 and 2005. Uh, we have the formation of the uh, Frazil ice, which has led to outages at Olkiloto in 2008 and also occasionally at earlier uh, occasions. Uh, Frazil ice is a type of frozen water that may form in, in subcooled moving uh, water. Uh, it's like a, some kind of ice slush uh, in a way. And that may form uh, quite quickly and can also partly block the cooling water intakes. So that could generate some problems for the operation. Uh, as Eric told us, in general, ice formation is likely to be reduced, or, or, or yes, ice formation in, in different aspects is, is likely to be reduced due to warmer weather, warmer climate. Uh, but it's important to bear in mind that ice at the surface is actually not a problem uh, for a power plant, for a nuclear power plant. Uh, the problem arises when it forms in this form, such as um, fresil ice, uh, submerged under the surface um, and uh, especially uh, in Finland there have been some occasions uh, to my knowledge we have not had these kind of incidents in Sweden could depend on maybe deeper uh, intake depths of the cooling water that can explain some of that difference but also of course uh, local uh, differences we have salt coating due to salt storms uh, of the switchyard facility at Ringhals in 2005. Uh, that is generally managed by uh, rinsing or flushing with fresh water. Uh, but at that specific time, the winds were so powerful uh, that that was not uh, doable um, to that extent that the con was considered necessary. So they actually um, uh, enclosed the plant, but it, it uh, went down uh, for a day, uh, or I think it was even two days. So once again, also these events, they have not been uh, related to safety in any way, but they have of course had obvious uh, effects on the operation, uh, yet with limited duration in, in time. Uh, we've also been told that uh, lessons were learned from these uh, events and measures uh, that increase the resilience towards uh, um, weather-related impacts have also been implemented since then. Uh, 
looking back in a longer time perspective, we can also conclude uh, by looking at the uh, incident reporting by the IAEA, for instance, that weather-related events have occurred very rarely in the Nordic countries. Uh, it's uh, typically and the magnitude of single hours uh, annually, or even less than that. Uh, that means, of course, that for certain years, such as the summer 2018, for some units, the weather-related events uh, have had a longer duration in time, while for other years, there have been none at all. But as we have uh, found in this study, we have reasons to believe that climate change potentially may increase the frequency of such disturbances in the future. And that this, of course, is relevant for the power plant operator. Then we also have the more in indirect impacts uh, that above all uh, for the nuclear industry uh, involves impacts on the external grid. Uh, the external grid is, uh, of course, something that is uh, important for the normal operation. To, to have access to a functioning external grid is, of course, important for the normal operation of a nuclear power plant. Uh, and that leads me to, I think, my final slide, uh, just a little bit more on some of the key weather events and phenomena that we have assessed. In this group, we have actually discussed quite a large number of uh, combinations of different weather events and possible impacts on the nuclear power plant. Uh, these are, I would say, maybe the most important ones uh, that have been judged as, as key uh, phenomena. Uh, and it's about um, the disturbance, the possible disturbance or actually damage on the internal and ele external electricity grid infrastructure through, for instance, lightning strikes. And as uh, Eric said, there is still some lack in knowledge uh, on lightning strikes and to what extent climate change may change frequency and amplitude of lightning strikes. For the nuclear industry, it's above all the amplitude that is uh, the most relevant information. There are lots of protective measures already implemented way back at the power plants. And uh, according to the working group, there are more available if that would be considered necessary in the future. Uh, these uh, measures are considered as, as relatively cheap in, in cost. If the external grid is lost through, for instance, a severe thunderstorm, then uh, normally uh, a nuclear power plant uh, moves into so-called house load operation. That is, uh, the, um, the, the, the plant is disconnected from the grid and the power output is uh, reduced as much as possible. Uh, the internal electricity use is supplied by the units and the excess uh, heat is uh, cooled. Um, um, this is beneficial and this is possible to maintain for days. Uh, it's not a problem at all. Uh, to have this state of or this mode of operation is beneficial for a swift reconnection to the grid once that already is ready for, once that again is ready for operation. Uh, but it's probably more a question of when the operator finds that there is no use because you actually don't earn any money during these, uh, this time. And, and the, the Nordic countries, these severe long-term uh, disturbances on the transmission grid, as to my knowledge, have been very rare if they even have occurred, I must say. Uh, Increasing seawater temperatures was also a key phenomenon that we were discussing quite thoroughly in the uh, working group. Increasing seawater temperature has, of course, a negative but fairly limited impact on the uh, thermal or electric efficiency of a nuclear power plant. Uh, you want to have the cooling water as cool as possible. Uh, we also have the um, uh, this this might sorry this might lead to 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 a reduction also in power output if the temperature reaches a certain level 
And finally, uh, you uh, close the unit if it uh, further increases, which happened in summer 2018, as I mentioned. Uh, this is once again a question for uh, economics. Um, measures available are a new heat exchanger capacity or even a relocation of the cooling water intake to deeper depth. Uh, these are measures that probably are pretty expensive, uh, so I think this uh, will be done in a close cost-benefit uh, analysis if, uh, if that would be uh, a question in the future, because we will see um, slowly increasing seawater temperatures, as Eric uh, uh, told us. There are also the possibility of refining the uh, technical design criteria, for instance. Um, there were different such uh, design criteria between Ringhals 2, that was a unit that closed during uh, summer 2018, while uh, the tolerance and uh, the margin in uh, the unit 3, for instance, were higher. Uh, so uh, that unit was not affected at all uh, of this uh, of the of that marine heat wave in 2018. So there are also design uh, considerations that can be uh, changed. Uh, and then, of course, increasing seawater temperature will most likely also increase the presence of marine organisms such as jellyfish and algae. Uh, that, as I showed you earlier, have uh, disturbed the operation not only in the Nordic countries but also across the world in different places um, uh, because they may partly or completely, in the worst case, uh, clog the cooling water intakes. Uh, these are events that have a pretty fast progress uh, and they are difficult to predict. Uh, they can form quickly and they are also dependent on sea currents and weather that makes them, them hard to predict. Uh, measures available and that have been implemented include uh, improved filtering and screening equipment but also technological development within the field of improved monitoring and detection uh, involving also artificial intelligence for instance in order to predict the formation of these kinds of organisms. Eric also Thomas, mentioned. Uh, could you please uh, wrap up? I minutes? will wrap up. Thank you, Monica. I will conclude just by a um, short um, uh, remark on sea level rise. Uh, flooding of a nuclear power plant is, of course, highly undesirable. That is truly a safety issue. And that's why the uh, uh, nuclear power plants are uh, localized uh, at heights above sea, normal sea level that are sufficient, uh, also considering very extreme uh, weather events. Sea level rise due to climate change will uh, reduce that safety margin. So this is something to monitor. Uh, we believe that uh, there is uh, no cause for any measures for a long time to come. And we're talking about here the southernmost localizations, Ringhals and Oskarshamn, uh, whether this might be a question uh, beyond 2050, uh, but most likely not until then, even if we consider more extreme temperature uh, scenarios, and even if we uh, consider the upper interval of the uncertainty uh, span of such uh, a development. Okay, thank you. That's all from me, Monica. Thank you very much, Thomas. And now we open up for questions and comments. Uh, we have one from Gerd van Richelen. Please, Gerd. It's, it's a bit noisy here. But my question is, are there any studies done considering downstream and upstream effects on nuclear power, on uh, global warming? Uh, I believe there are. Uh, I'm not sure. I, I know that NIA has done some research on that. Uh, I would gladly invite somebody else who knows that better than me, but uh, I think they have done some on, on at least on upstream, uh, to my knowledge. Please uh, fill in. Thank you. And then we have a question from Henri Payer. 
Yes. Uh, good morning, and uh, and, and congratulations to, uh, to 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 all of you for this uh, for this study. I'm I'm uh, wor working at the International Atomic Energy Agency, but uh, uh, previously I was uh, at the OECD Nuclear Energy Agency, and we had a, a big study that is unfortunately not yet published, but on 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 the topic that you covered uh, today in your uh, uh, in the webinar. Uh, I think it will be published later this year. Uh, um, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to see that all the conclusions that you uh, 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 found from uh, looking at uh, the situation in, in, in Sweden and Finland is also uh, uh, goes along the, the same uh, uh, conclusions that the, the OECD study has, has made. Um, my, my specific question is not a question, but it's a call for comments. It um, uh, relates to uh, what you said uh, rightly that uh, um, uh, you can um, uh, you can uh, adapt uh, nuclear power plants to to increase increase the, the the resilience, but it's a it's a question of economics, the cost of uh, adaptation ver versus the, the the return on investments. And, and actually, during the, the study, we had some uh, um, uh, case studies from 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 Nordic countries where uh, uh, the experience was that uh, uh, some investments some adaptation measures were were considered but they were found to be too expensive compared to 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 the the, the return on investment because because of the uh, the way electricity markets uh, are, are, are designed and 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 with very low wholesale electricity markets usually in the nordic countries uh, as well as in a, a lot of uh, uh, questions in Europe, uh, and one one I would say recommendation from 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 the OECD study was that uh, maybe there should be a framework for for governments to encourage investments when when uh, I would say the economic case is n not necessarily uh, sufficiently high uh, because uh, these investments in the long term will increase the resilience and will be beneficial for the whole society. So that was my question, a bit long. Thank you, Ari. Yes, and of course, if you look at the situation today in the Nordics, uh, a lot of benefits that we provide with the Nordic nuclear power plants, it's benefits that we don't get paid for. I mean, if we would get paid for all of the benefits that we provide, then the economic situation would perhaps be different. And also, there is this complex situation with uh, different areas within the, the Nordic electricity system. So we can have really big differences in electricity price in different parts of this system. So it's extremely difficult to predict what kind of return you would get on investment. Are there any other questions? Or perhaps any comments from anyone in the working group on nuclear that's been involved in the project? Would any of you like to comment something? Maybe if I if I can make another comment. Yes, please. Okay. No, there was a question on 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 upstream. Uh, in, in the uh, OECD study, we we did look at uh, uh, uranium mining uh, and uh, the impact of climate change and and and, and uh, especially water scarcity uh, uh, on uh, uranium uh, uranium mining and uh, sometimes uh, it's actually water scarcity in some regions and then we had. Uh, we had uh, cases of uh, flooding in Australia, for example, that uh, um, uh, uh, caused the uh, uranium mines to, to close for over a year. So huge, huge uh, uh, economic impacts also on, on the Euro uranium mining industry. Um, so, so, so it's something also that uh, needs to be uh, 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 um, uh, addressed. Yes, thank you. Really looking forward to, to this study. When you publish it, then please send me a link and I can distribute it to the persons that signed up for this webinar. So there is room for one or two more questions before we close this today. And if there are no questions, oh, there, if there are no questions from the audience, then I would like to ask a question. Uh, you mentioned this compound event. That's very difficult to predict. What compound events would you say are most interesting from a nuclear point of view? Uh, 
This sort of question both to Eric and to Thomas. Well, I, I might start here. Can you you can please fill in? Um, there is a concern of I think uh, in the long term perspective, there is a concern for, for instance, potential flooding, and and flooding can be a result of of um, several things. But I think if you would combine uh, powerful winds uh, with with uh, other negative uh, weather events at the same time. Uh, heavy rain, for instance. Um, uh, I think that could be one example of a compound event that is, uh, I think, relevant to learn more about for the nuclear industry. Yeah, I can quickly fill in there as well. I think also the on the on the more upstream activities you talked about the or, or downstream, which should be I mean downstream, yeah, on the on the grid, on the electricity grid. If you have very long dry periods and dry conditions, and and the, there are forest fires like we had in 2018, that's of con a main concern, of course, and uh, or it could be a main concern, and and that's one such typical ty type of compound event especially if there are strong winds associated in, in those occasions and you have a wide spreading on forest, forest fires, for instance. Thank you very much. And I think that uh, our time is up. So I would like to thank all the speakers and all of you participants. And it's really reassuring that we didn't find any big sort of safety issues in this study. It's only economical uh, issues that can be found. So that's very, very nice and reassuring for us in, in the nuclear sector. Thank you very much, everybody, and have a nice day. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. bye, -bye. Thank you for the excellent webinar. Bye bye. bye, -bye. <laughs> Thank you for a good seminar. Thank you.